and remembrance. We ask Almighty God to watch over our nation and grant us patience and resolve in all that is to come. As we've been assured, neither death front lines in the search for survivors, rescuers digging through a mountain of destruction. Handshaking and back slapping, President Bush tours the ruins of lower Manhattan and vows the attackers will hear all of us soon. And the flicker of candles illuminates Central Park, Americans gathering to share their grief. Hello, you're watching CNN's continuing coverage of America's new war. I'm Colleen McEdwards at CNN Center. And I'm Jim Clancy. We're going to begin our report with the latest developments in the aftermath of Tuesday's catastrophe. Well, down in a canyon of mud and rubble, the search for any signs of life and for the dead goes on at ground zero. Workers are inspecting tons of debris left from the collapse of the World Trade Center towers. Anything that could be evidence is being sent to a joint terrorist task force. At the Pennsylvania crash site, an encouraging word. Just hours ago, searchers found the cockpit voice recorder from the hijacked United 757. Authorities in Washington will study that recorder to see what it reveals about the final minutes before impact. President George Bush left New York after meeting with rescue workers. Authorities made their first arrest in con connection with the hijackings. It is a man they say is a material witness taken into custody at John F. Kennedy Airport. While in Congress, the House has joined the Senate in passing a resolution that authorizes the president to use all necessary force in retaliation for the attacks. Mr. Bush, meantime, says the search goes on for the mastermind behind the plot. We're gathering all the possible evidence. And at the appropriate time, we will let America know what the evidence is. Do you president? feel like you know who did it? We know we got a suspect. Well, in New York, these are moments to mourn and moments to remember, but not yet a time to give up hope. While workers sift through those still smoking ruins, survivors and loved ones keep a vigil for the more than 4,700 people who are missing at this point. And keeping it all in perspective for us is Garrick Utley. He is in New York and joins us now. Garrick? Good morning, Colleen. Um, well, given all that's transpired uh, in New York City, particularly in Manhattan this week, New Yorkers can be grateful for small blessings. And one of those small blessings was not just that President uh, Bush came here, but even more important than that from a New Yorker perspective is how he came here. Usually a president visits New York City, lands at JFK, big presidential motorcade comes in, snarls up traffic, New Yorkers and their cars fume. Uh, there's not much we can do about it. This time, though, because of security reasons, the plans were different. The president landed in Air Force Base outside of New York, helicoptered in, caused very little uh, disruption in, in life here. There's been enough disruption, as we know, uh, since uh, Tuesday. And he visited the rescue operation down there in lower Manhattan, where you have some pictures of that. The president was there um, talking with firemen and all the other rescue uh, uh, participants, the mayor, the governor was there. And then it just really what turned into an extraordinary communing with the workers. And there are about 1,000 workers at any given time there on the site. He had this to say. I want you all to know that America today, America today is on bended knee in prayer for the people whose lives were lost here, for the workers who work here, for the families who mourn. This nation stands with the good people of New York City and New Jersey and Connecticut 
as we mourn the loss of thousands of our citizens. I can hear you! <laughs> I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people and the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. The atmosphere, as you can see there, was quite uh, warm and emotional, although the weather has turned cooler the first few days. It was summerish here in New York City. That helped the, uh, the workers down there. But now we've had rainstorms and autumn is in the air, and Alessio Vinci is there on location. Alessio? Well, good evening, uh, Garrick. Well, there was rain yesterday, and today it's a very cold, bitterly cold, I would say. And we have reported many incredible stories in the past few days uh, since the two uh, jetliners crashed into the uh, Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. And uh, what we're seeing now behind me is perhaps one of those incredible stories. As you can see from these live pictures that we're providing to you now, there is still smoke rising on top of that pile of rubble almost four days, as I said, after the crash. Uh, uh, the rescue operation is continuing on a 24-hour operation. There was a brief interruption uh, today and earlier yesterday due to the, uh, to the rain, but now the rescue workers are back at work um, on their 12-hour uh, shift. The weather, as I said, is very cold. The rain yesterday making the site a little bit more slippery and more dangerous for the rescue workers. But as I said, now it's been dry for the last, uh, for the last 12 hours or so. So the, op the operation is continuing uh, uh, quite spe uh, speedily. Uh, chances to find somebody alive at this time are growing uh, dim. As pe people will begin to speak about any kind of miracle if anybody is found alive underneath that rubble. However, there are still 4,717 people missing. And uh, the rescue workers with whom we've been able to speak earlier today must believe that somebody underneath that pile of rubble still must be um, alive. The uh, latest uh, number, however, speak for themselves. 185 people have been found dead, 480, uh, 408 body parts so far. And Mayor Rudolf Giuliani saying yesterday that he still was hopeful that the, uh, some survivors could have been found. However, uh, some of the engineers there on site also saying that it was quite possible that uh, uh, m many of those 4,000 people still missing, their bodies will never be found because when the uh, jet crashed into those two towers, of course, there was a lot of, they were loaded with a lot of fuel. The fire was extremely intense and many of those bodies uh, were burned completely. Uh, more than 13,000 tons of debris has been uh, recovered from uh, the site. They've been mainly uh, taken to Staten Island there. The FBI is sifting through the debris and trying to get any kind of clues from the debris to find out if perhaps any of those uh, uh, evidence of who the hijackers may be. We have a list of names, but perhaps in that uh, debris, the uh, uh, FBI can find some more clues. Back to you, Garrick. Yes, Alessio, it's a rather sensitive point, of course. You, you touched on it, though, and I think we should follow up on it. Um, the rescue workers there, uh, they're not finding survivors. They don't really believe they're going to find survivors, but still city officials aren't saying that all hope is lost. But tell us a bit about the atmosphere and what you're hearing from those workers there. I mean, are they, do, they, do they hold out any hope still? They, they, they did not give up on hope, especially because they can hear on television, perhaps, or on the radio every day, that the people up at the armory are still hoping to be able to find their people alive. And therefore, the rescue workers here perhaps believe that it is up to them to uh, meet some of those uh, hopes and then see if perhaps somebody in an air pocket or perhaps underneath a large uh, uh, piece of concrete may still, uh, may still uh, be alive. And also, uh, Garrick, it's important to know that underneath that rubble, there are still uh, 300 firemen, uh, 30 police officers, 30 port authority, port, port authority officers. These are all people who are people, uh, some of the people who are there are new, uh, new. There were some friends, some comrades, and therefore perhaps that particular element also is giving the rescue operation here and then another boost in trying to find perhaps one of their comrades still alive. So there is still not only the fact to find people who are working in there, but also some of their comrades who rushed into the building soon after the plane crashed into it before it collapsed. Thank you very much, Alessio. Certainly a very strong motivating force to keep on digging, keep on working. Back now to Jim and Colleen in Atlanta. All right, Gary, thank you for that. 
Well, moving now from rescue and recovery toward retaliation, something that may also be in the future a sure sign of America's resolve. President Bush authorizing the Defense Department to call up as many as 50,000 military reservists for homeland defense. With the latest from the Pentagon, now we're joined by Mark Potter live. Mark. Well, there are a couple of issues going on here at the Pentagon. There is the uh, reserve call up and there is uh, taking care of the Pentagon building itself. About a third of the complex uh, remains closed after being hit by the uh, hijacked jetliner on Thursday. Uh, intense flames and smoke and water contributed uh, to the extensive damage to the area, which ironically had just finished being renovated. And officials estimate it could take uh, any, uh, it could take several years uh, to rebuild uh, th this area, and could cost anywhere between a hundred million and one billion dollars to do that. Now, as we can see here in this live picture, uh, the workers continue uh, to pour uh, through the building uh, to sift through the rubble. Uh, they're still trying to find victims. Uh, they're trying to shore up the building so that they can work more safely there. The safety is, a, is a, a, an extreme consideration here. Uh, there are some very dangerous uh, conditions. Occasionally, fires break out also. Uh, they are also uh, looking for evidence uh, to help the FBI with its criminal case. Um, the estimated death toll uh, now stands at 189. That's 125 Pentagon personnel and about 60 and, and, and uh, 64 uh, passengers from the American Airlines jet. Now, the, uh, today the uh, the Pentagon is putting together plans for the activation of the reservists that you were talking about. Some 35,000 reservists. Uh, the military says it will first ask for volunteers, and it uh, already seems that there are a lot of those. We've had people who are knocking on the doors seeking to help. They want to serve. They want to be a part of this. They're very emotional. We've had to say, wait a little bit. You know, it's, it's, we've only had a matter of hours since this all began. We're proceeding along the, uh, our way, and now we have the authorization to bring those people on board. The reservists will be used to help with the disaster relief efforts and also uh, to support the National Guard pilots who uh, have been seen particularly over the skies of, uh, in the skies over Washington, D.C. and New York uh, flying the combat air patrols, as we can see here. Uh, they are also on standby, a 15-minute standby at a number of bases around the country. Uh, this uh, call-up would involve uh, also the Coast Guard reservists who would uh, uh, be involved in uh, shoring up the defenses along the nation's, uh, at the nation's seaports. Uh, the call-up will begin in the next few days and, we'll, uh, and we will see people leaving their families and their civilian jobs among those who are likely to be activated, uh, engineers, uh, doctors, military police, uh, air defense, and intelligence specialists and chaplains. Jim, back to you. All right, Mark Potter reporting there live from the Pentagon. Well, from coast to coast on Friday, Americans paused. They paused to mourn. The National Day of Prayer and Remembrance inspired candlelight vigils for the victims and their families. In Providence, Rhode Island, thousands of people went to the State House to hold candles in memory of those who lost their lives. They listened to state leaders speak about the need to unite as a nation. In Boston, Some 3,000 people set candles afloat in a reflecting pool beside a church as the Boston Symphony Orchestra played hymns and patriotic songs. And in Denver, Colorado, the Mile High City, people held candles in Washington Park just as dusk began to fall across the Rockies. New arrivals at the vigil lit their candles from those held by mourners already there. On the west coast in Seattle, Washington, thousands of candles flickered on the harbor steps across the Seattle Art from the uh, Seattle Art Museum. Just a few of many such ceremonies held all across the United States. Colleen. And Jim, people gathered in churches, synagogues, and mosques around the country as well to remember the victims. The National Cathedral in Washington was the site of a, a solemn and quite an emotional midday prayer service. Past presidents, current leaders all attended this service. In a display of America's religious diversity, 
Prayers at the cathedral were offered by Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, and Muslim clergy. One of the country's preeminent religious figures, the Reverend Billy Graham, gave the sermon. Yes, our nation has been attacked, buildings destroyed, lives lost. But now we have a choice, whether to implode and disintegrate emotionally and spiritually as a people and a nation, or whether we choose to become stronger through all of this struggle to rebuild on a solid foundation. And Friday was prayer day for the Muslim community in Brooklyn, New York, a couple of miles from the World Trade Center. U.S. officials say evidence suggests that those behind the attacks were fanatical Muslims bent on a holy war against America. But still, some Arab Americans are finding themselves the target of violence. Here's CNN's Richard Blystone with that. A community rich in immigrants, sharing the time-honored aim of making it in America. Still on good terms with their old cultures. Still strong in their faith, Islam. Atlantic Avenue, they proudly say, is the oldest Arab community in New York. And as stunned as anyone by Tuesday's carnage. It's shocking, it's uh, horrible. Um, uh, you feel very bad, you know. What's different here is fear of taking the blame. All Arab American and Muslims in this country that resides and live and make their living in this country are as good as American as anyone else that came from all over the world and they love the American flag just like any play, anyone else and they have nothing to do against this country and this is one of the reasons we are living in this country. Nonetheless, Atlantic Avenue today is keeping a low profile lest the rash of slurs and slights and insults get more serious. Ahmed Morsi is passing out a letter in Arabic from the New York District Attorney, telling Arabs and Muslims where to call if harassed or attacked, like his own mother on Tuesday. She was spit at, um, go back to your country, die, this and all these different slurs um, and different, um, you, know, uh, you know, my mother. <laughs> Islam is a religion of tolerance, says the Imam Abdul Rahman Tafa, a religion that forbids ignorant wars between nations. Muslims from 22 nations come to pray here. We all feel the pain of what happens, says the Imam. And he asks, please give blood, money, whatever you can to help victims of the disaster. But if the attackers were Muslims pursuing what they saw as a holy war, did Islam attack America? Jihad is for defense and defense only, he says. And anyone who preaches otherwise doesn't know Islam. The Quran says if a man murders another human being, it is as though he killed all humanity. This Friday service ends with special prayers for all those who were killed, including at least 50 Muslims. Richard Blystone, CNN, Brooklyn, New York. Well, many countries around the world join the American people in a day of mourning and remembrance, people from all backgrounds. And for more on that, let's cross over now and wish Jane Dutton a good morning there in London. Jane. Hey, Jane. Good morning. Now, there's been an overwhelming show of emotional and political support. A number of heads of state have already pledged their country support for the U.S. government and are urging others to do the same. At a memorial in Ottawa, Canadian Prime Minister Jean Chrétien made it clear his country is behind President George W. Bush no matter what. Describing Canada's relationship with the U.S., he said, our friendship has no limit. And in Berlin. Hundreds of thousands of Germans lit candles as they gathered to mourn America's loss. After the ceremony, they held a march for peace on the streets of Berlin. South Africans are among those who are mourning. At least nine South Africans are missing after the attacks. In Pretoria, 
Residents waited in line Friday to sign books of condolence at the U.S. Embassy. Charlene hunter -Gold has this report. A somber service, no singing. Highly unusual in a country where singing is a staple of any gathering. But on this day, only words, sad words, from Christians. Our humanity <laughs> lies in dust and ashes around us. Words of reconciliation from Muslims. He who forgives and makes reconciliation, his reward is due from the Almighty. Words of condolence from Christians, Muslims, and Jews. After, words from the worried. I am a Christian woman married to a Muslim husband. And the need for the world to unite is for me the most important thing right now. This could lead to war, intolerance of each other. It could destroy families. It could destroy nations. I do feel that that might spread to the whole world, the evil that is taking place. Words of hope. And I wish that the, the rest of the world would follow the South African position where through dialogue we've achieved peace and we live peacefully. Not far away at the U.S. consulate, South African visitors bearing gifts and more words. It's just sweeten the American people that are here, that are alive. They, they die and, and just hopefully fill the void of what's happened. I mean, from Morocco, you know, and doesn't matter if I'm Moroccan, I'm Muslim, or I'm Christian, or I'm Jewish, doesn't make a difference. But this really tells me a lot. At the airport, where flights to America remain on hold, words of frustration. Like, I'm a nurse, so you just feel like, oh, you know, you could help out in some way, but, you know, your hands are tied, stuck here. We stand ready to extend such humanitarian assistance as we may be requested to extend. This is the least we can do. South Africa's political history as diplomatic friend to all and most recently host to the World Racism Conference where it insisted the Palestinian issue deserved a hearing raised concerns as the U.S. contemplates its response. Hopefully South Africa will end up on the right side of the fence even if it means that we will have to say goodbye to many of the rogue states we are currently embracing. And we are part of the world that is saying the perpetrators of this must be found and they must, first, must face the weight of the law. We must implore on United States and NATO to avoid the same level of indiscriminate action when, when meeting punishment to the guilty parties. No one is sure exactly how long the American flag will fly at half-staff here. But as long as it does, South Africans say they want Americans to know they're with them in their hour of sorrow and grief. Charlene hunter -Galt, CNN, Johannesburg. People in China are showing their support for the victims. Students at a private elementary and middle school in Beijing held a memorial on Friday. A representative from each grade level offered a bouquet of flowers to a wreath for victims of the attack. Students and teachers observed a moment of silence. People have also been placing flowers outside the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. In Iran, where the United States has long been considered the enemy, an unprecedented show of sympathy. 60,000 spectators and soccer players observed a minute of silence at the Tehran soccer stadium before a World Cup qualifying match. Iranian leaders have strongly condemned Tuesday's attacks, a gesture a U.S. State Department official has said Washington would like to build on in the future. That's a look at how the world is reacting. I'm Jane Dutton in London. Now back to Jim at CNN Center. All right, Jane, thanks for that. One of the 64 people who was aboard the American Airlines Flight 77, that's the one that crashed into the Pentagon Tuesday, was a woman named Barbara Olson, a television commentator and the wife of U.S. Solicitor General Ted Olson. She managed to make two cell phone calls to her husband in the minutes before the plane crashed. Mr. Olson says now he's coping by taking it one day at a time. I left the home a little before six, as I said, and Barbara left not long thereafter to catch the plane. And it was my birthday. And when I got, when I finally went to bed, it was after one o'clock. 
um, on, sep on, on now it was September 12th, there was a, a note that Barbara had written to me on the pillow um, saying, um, I love you. When you read this, I will be thinking of you and I will be back on, I will be back Friday. Olson says his wife was aware of the World Trade Center attacks. He says her last words to him were, what do you want me to tell the pilot to do? Now, during Larry King's uh, program, he also spoke to a remarkable survivor of all of the death and destruction at the World Trade Center towers. Michael Higson, who is blind, worked on the 78th floor of the first tower to be struck by a hijacked plane. His guide dog helped him begin his escape. You're walking down 78 floors. You got a friend with you and you got your dog. Are you scared? Oh, no question. I uh, was very concerned. I didn't hear the second plane hit, but we knew that at that time something had happened. We, we figured that a plane had hit the building because I could smell and we all could smell uh, jet fuel fumes. So we knew there was something going on. Hankson and his dog made it to the lobby, left the tower, and took shelter in a subway just as the building started to collapse. Well, as people struggle to cope with the aftermath of these attacks, the entertainment community has begun to show its support as well. Lauren Hunter has more on that. The scenes are grim, the mood somber. People throughout the country struggle to deal with their grief and search for ways to show their support days after the devastating terrorist attacks in New York and Washington. Our entire country is now facing a national emergency. In the, the entertainment community, artists are standing in solidarity and sympathy with Tuesday's and victims and their families with both their time and their money. Rosie O'Donnell has been a tremendous supporter of the Red Cross, particularly in the areas of disaster relief um, and, and our mental health services. And yesterday she made a $1 million donation to support the American Red Cross in our efforts. Jennifer Lopez also gave, writing a $25,000 check to the relief effort, as did Earth, Wind & Fire. Rob Lowe gave in a different way, donating blood, while Kathleen Turner volunteered at St. Vincent's Hospital in New York, and Edward James Olmos spoke out for tolerance at the Islamic Center in Los Angeles. We are one race, and that's the human race, period. Madonna resumed her tour in Los Angeles, dedicating proceeds from her remaining shows to a fund honoring those affected by the tragedy. Clear Channel is the worldwide concert promoter for Madonna and scores of other artists and has created its own relief fund. But Leonard Skinner and the Backstreet Boys have stepped up immediately and they've already made significant contributions to the fund. Uh, and I'm sure that either with us or in their own way, you know, the live entertainment industry and the members of the industry will, will come to the table. The Screen Actors Guild did, donating $50,000 to a special New York State fund for families of victims. We're only too glad to do it, and, and I think it's our duty to help, and duty of all Americans to help. Though life in the United States will never be the same, entertainers from Hollywood to Broadway are uniting with their countrymen to weave a national tapestry of healing. And may God bless America. Lauren Hunter, CNN, Los Angeles. We want to pay tribute now to some of the first victims of that terrible Tuesday, the passengers and the crew of that first jetliner that crashed into the World Trade Center. Frank Sesno looks at some of them as America remembers. Lost on American Flight 11 from Boston, headed to Los Angeles. Carol Bouchard, an emergency room secretary, she was on her way to Las Vegas with her friend Renee Newell. Renee worked for the airline and gave Carol a buddy pass so the two could vacation together. Tara Creamer was on a business trip to Los Angeles and worried about leaving her two children, Colin, four, and Nora, one. Her husband, John, called her a kind and loving wife and mother. 71-year-old Thelma Cusinello was on her way to visit older sister Grace and her brother-in-law in Los Angeles. Thelma did not get to see her sister often and was overjoyed when her daughter found her a discount cross-country fare. Nellie Casey was on her first business trip. Since coming back from a six-month maternity leave, she would have celebrated her fifth wedding anniversary with husband Michael on September 21st. Linda George, 27, was on a buying trip for an apparel company. She and her fiancé were planning their wedding. It was scheduled for next month. 
American Flight 11 crashed into the World Trade Center at 8.45 a.m. Eastern Time on September 11, 2001. Colleen, that certainly puts a face on it uh, and brings it into focus. Just, you know, the terrible loss that thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of families, relatives, everyone. Well, because we do talk about the numbers because of the scale of it, it's natural to do so, but you're quite right. I mean, it's a human tool and that says it, doesn't it? And people all around the country want to know what is going on in this story, the latest news. That's why so many people are watching right now in the middle of the night in the United States. And we want to keep you updated with the, uh, our coverage of America's new war. The work is slow and tedious, but workers continue to dig away at the massive mounds of debris that have been left by the collapse of New York's Twin Towers. Anything that might yield evidence is being sent to a joint task force for review. Searchers at last make a key find in Pennsylvania, the cockpit voice recorder from the downed United 757. It may yield clues to the plane's final moments. And the House has joined the Senate in giving President George W. Bush new power to wage war. The measure allows Mr. Bush to use force against whoever is deemed responsible for the hijackings. Congress is also appropriating $40 billion for recovery and military efforts. Well, one branch of the investigation into Tuesday's attacks led authorities to Hamburg, Germany where German police have searched four apartments at the request of the FBI. Bettina Luscher has more. Technical University Hamburg Harburg, a campus where German prosecutors say two of the alleged hijackers studied. Mohammed Atta is believed to have studied here for eight years under the name of Mohammed El Amir. A professor still cannot believe his former student could have been a terrorist. Mohammed El Amir was an extremely nice, very religious, helpful, active student, says Professor Dietmar Machule. There was no indication that he would be involved in such a horrible crime. Professor Machule teaches urban planning, and the student in question wrote his thesis for him in 1999. There's a strong similarity to the photo in the media, but I have to say I'm not totally certain. Mohammed Atta started an Islamic prayer group at the university. The Islamic group was founded by him. He was a founder and they had received a praying room from the Asta, which is the um, students union. That group has now been shut down and the prayer room sealed by authorities. The second student whom authorities believe was aboard the hijacked plane is Marwan al Sheri who was enrolled here from October 99 until September 2000. I think we did never see him in the lectures. And even uh, as we tried to uh, send him his documents, uh, we couldn't reach him. A third student is believed to have been part of an alleged terrorist group here in Hamburg, but German authorities have released few details. For students and professors, the accusations have come as a shock. Es gibt Leute, there were people who started crying when they saw Mohammed. Bettina Lüscher, CNN, Hamburg. And people wondering what shape the, the fight against those responsible, the, the response, the retaliation, whatever words you choose uh, against those responsible for the attacks. People saying it most likely will be more than a military undertaking. Analysts saying that it could be a concerted effort to weed out the shadowy groups that may have been involved. Well, counterterrorism expert Lee Weavers joins us now from London with more on this. Mr. Weavers, thanks so much for being here. You know, a lot of people are saying that this has to be several groups. What do you think of that? Well, I, I think it's always very difficult to define exactly uh, which organization is working with the other uh, terrorist organization at any one time. Uh, I think it's likely in these circumstances that there is an alliance of groups. Uh, and certainly when you look at what has occurred uh, and the suspicions that we still have, that there are a number of groups or terrorists still uh, awaiting uh, perhaps the opportunity to launch further attacks. Uh, I think we have to keep a very open mind as to precisely who will be cooperating with whom. And when you say there's a chance of further attacks, what sort of form do you think those would take? I mean, is, is there any chance that, that this group or these groups would try to use the same tactics twice? 
Um, I think that's probably unlikely. I mean, the essence of a, of a terrorist attack, of course, is, is based upon the element of surprise. And in, in these circumstances, uh, very many measures have now been put in place. Uh, I suspect, though, that there may be, op may be opportunities uh, in other areas that could be exploited. Uh, at the same time, it's likely, we think, uh, from our analysis, that the uh, probable position at this time is that the terrorists will await a response first of all uh, to these last attacks. Well, and what are the what are the risks inherent in a response? I mean, if if the US and and whatever coalition it builds decides to go ahead and use force, does that only guarantee more retaliation from the terrorists? Well, I think uh, and you mentioned earlier that the, re the response would come from more than one area. I think any form of response will need to be balanced and it would almost certainly involve a number of countries. I also feel uh, quite strongly that this will require not just a military response. Uh, this, as I believe uh, one of your leaders has already mentioned, is likely to be a campaign over a lengthy period. Uh, and our experience, certainly in the UK, uh, has taught us that we need to use every opportunity, develop good intelligence uh, capabilities and ensure that we have a good frontline capability uh, in trying to ensure that we can not only respond to any uh, uh, attack that takes place on ourselves, but that we're also capable of reacting in a proportionate and legitimate way in order to firstly identify evidence and secondly bring those responsible to justice. Well, you know, and there's a lot of debate about how best that, that would be done. Is it, is it necessary for intelligence to actually infiltrate these groups, get, get dirty, as, as people are saying, in a way that perhaps the international community hasn't been willing to in, in, in the past? Uh, well, I, I think that's highly problematical because of the nature of the groups. Uh, infiltration is an extremely difficult thing to affect. It's more likely that using intelligence uh, sources of our own uh, and really trying to improve our capacity, not just in any one country but across the world, that we're likely to be more effective. The lesson certainly from the UK is that we have become and we've been forced to become far better coordinated uh, in the last 15 to 20 years and we now act very much as one integrated body. Now we are unfortunately one of the leading nations in this sense. Uh, many others have lots of disparate agencies working in particular areas of their own. You know, and I think probably the biggest uh, opportunity here is for us all to integrate our capability, uh, thereby ensuring that we do maximise both our intelligence capability and the ability to monitor those who are plotting uh, attacks of this type. You know, my colleague Jim Clancy and I were talking just a, just a short while ago about a question we don't hear being asked, and that is in, in terms of preventing these attacks in the future, how important is it uh, for the international community to, to, to try to help get the conflict in the Middle East resolved? Um, well, I, I think uh, when we look at the political uh, developments of, of recent years and, and the general scenario that exists around the world, uh, terrorism generally uh, emanates from places where there are conflicts, disagreements and large disaffected groups. I think in the longer term, no matter what law enforcers and security agencies do, uh, we have to look at this wider picture and consider what can be done from a policy standpoint to try and actually remove the, re the, the root cause. Lee Weavers, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Lee Weavers joining us from London. Jim. Interesting interview. Well, Congress showing a united front in granting President Bush the authority to retaliate against terrorism, but as Jonathan Carl tells us, some lawmakers still have concerns about just how far those powers should go. With virtually no dissent, Congress authorized the president to use all necessary and appropriate force against all those tied to the attacks. For constitutional purposes, it's the same as a declaration of war. There is no constitutional difference between authorizing the president to use this kind of force and saying we declare war. The hurried vote united conservatives and liberals who usually disagree about military intervention. Paul Wellstone, whose first significant vote as a senator a decade ago was against the use of force against Iraq in the Persian Gulf War, was one of the few to speak before the vote. It's going to be a long, difficult struggle, but I believe people in our country and people in Minnesota are united in this. 
but we need to do this the smart way. Despite the lack of debate, members of both parties had privately objected to a White House request for a more open-ended authorization of force against terrorists. As a result, the resolution passed authorizes the president to use military action specifically, quote, against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001 or harbored such organizations or persons. It relates to the incident, and there's broad authority relating to the incident. It does not relate to all terrorism every place. Several key leaders hope to avoid a repeat of the 1964 Tonkin Gulf Resolution, in which Congress, after North Vietnam allegedly attacked U.S. warships, almost unanimously granted President Johnson the authority, quote, to take all necessary measures to prevent further aggression by North Vietnam. Many in Congress came to regret that as the Vietnam War escalated and grew increasingly unpopular. While only Congress has the power to declare war, the president under the Constitution has the power to repel invasion. And if a war drags on, Congress, with its power of the purse, can ultimately bring an end to it by refusing to pay for it. Jonathan Carl, CNN, Capitol Hill. U.S. officials say Osama bin Laden is the prime suspect behind these terrorist attacks. But as David Inser tells us, getting at the suspect may be more complicated than it appears. The nation is angry about thousands of innocent deaths. U.S. officials say the evidence so far points to Osama bin Laden's group, and the Bush administration is talking tough. We will go after that group, that network, and those who have harbored supported and aided that network to rip the network up. And when we were through with that network, we will continue with a global assault against terrorism in general. But if it is bin Laden, how to get at him and his top lieutenants? Some argue for giving Afghanistan's Taliban government an ultimatum, turn him over or else. We know where your ministries are. We know where your houses are. We're simply going to obliterate them from the face of the planet. Bouncing that rubble with a lot of B-52 uh, loads of bombs I don't think he's going to change Afghanistan all that much. No, say most analysts in and out of government. If you want to roll up bin Laden and al-Qaeda, it is going to take more than bombs. It will take ground troops. In order for us to preserve America and our way of life, we're going to have to sacrifice American treasure and unfortunately, in some cases, perhaps some American blood. It is not just a question of grabbing or killing one man or even 20. <laughs> There are a dozen or more training camps, U.S. intelligence says, producing more terrorists dedicated to killing Americans. Revenge alone is not an answer. Uh, there has to be a complete eradication and elimination of all the training camps. And much of bin Laden's base of support is in neighboring Pakistan, through which money from around the Arab world is funneled to the al-Qaeda coffers. It is a treacherous and dangerous area indeed. If you start moving in grand groups and you're willing to occupy countries for long periods of time, you do change things rather significantly for terrorists. But then we I'm not sure this country is ready to do that, even if it does have a fit of passion right now. And I'm not, it may or may not make sense for the U.S. to do that in its larger interests. David Ensor, CNN, Washington. More streets of lower Manhattan are going to be reopening in the coming hours, but at the site at the World Trade Center, rescue operators are very much still underway. For the past few days, Gary Gutley has been updating us from New York. Let's join him once again now. Derek, Eric. Thank you, Jim. As you know, we're into the first weekend here in New York City following uh, last Tuesday's, um, what do we want to call it, grotesqueness and tragedy. And New Yorkers, of course, like people elsewhere, have to decide, what am I going to do this weekend? Well, do I go to a baseball game? No, there's no baseball game. They've been canceled. Go to a pro football game, the NFL on Sunday? No, they've been canceled too. Maybe go to a movie, but who needs to see an action movie with cars and buildings exploding? Well, then go to a comedy, but are we really ready to laugh yet? Well, you're running short of possibilities now, but there is one new destination in Manhattan that a number of people are going to uh, visit and spend some time there. And our Jody Ross is live on the location to tell us why they're going there. Hi, Jody. 
Hi, Garrick. They are coming here to register names of missing persons and family members. And this is also a place, sort of a gathering spot for people now who are trying to find some comfort and solace. The armory behind me actually closed tonight at midnight, but the Salvation Army will provide food and supplies throughout the night. And the crowds of people looking for these missing family members and friends have, of course, dispersed at this late hour. But earlier tonight, we heard another story. This one from Hassan Chowdhury, a man looking for his friend, whose wife just gave birth to a baby boy. What's the hardest part for you, Hassan, day to day, not knowing where he is? Well, the gradually the feelings are going away because uh, it's a horrible thing that happened, and it's absolutely impossible because he was working on the one or two floor, 102nd floor, and there's a very, very slim chance, you know as far as my opinion but anything miracle could happen so we hope for the best and uh, if he's alive and uh, that's great it'll be you know, exciting no doubt about it, especially for his family wife and the kids and uh, and besides this my community you know we all from bangladesh and my our condolence to his family and beside that to all the other american peoples you know, and each of them our best sympathy and condolence to each of them who have lost their lives. The people may be gone, but the one thing that remains here are the hundreds of posters plastered literally everywhere on every surface, and the people who continue to come by even at this late hour to take a look, maybe read a statistic, maybe reflect for a moment. Candles remain lit from the vigil, the nationwide vigil that started tonight at 7 p.m. And when a candle does go out here, it seems like there's always somebody around to relight it. So on a day when no survivors were found at the disaster site, there is a small glimmer of hope here in New York City at this very dark hour. Garrick, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you very much, Jody, there on location at the Armory. Um, incidental point right here, there are certain dates which you only have to mention them and a whole event comes to life, it's usually a traumatic event. And December 7th for Americans, that of course means Pearl Harbor. What will be the lasting impact in our memory of September 11th, which was the day, the date on Tuesday when this tragedy occurred? Will that resonate like December 7th? Well, perhaps yes, perhaps not. I did a little research to find out what competition September 11th and last Tuesday will have in that uh, department. Keep up with a couple of little interesting uh, tidbits. On September 11th, 1941, does that say anything to you? Probably not. Well, on September 11th, 1941 was the groundbreaking for a new building uh, in our nation's capital here in the United States. Uh, the government felt it needed uh, more space for this particular department, so it built it just across the Potomac from Washington, D.C. It had five sides to it, so they called it the Pentagon. Sixty years to the day before that plane flew into the Pentagon last Tuesday. Item number two, September 11, 1609. What happened on September 11, 1609? Well, there wasn't much here in New York City, but an explorer named Henry Hudson sailed into the bay, set foot on an island which would become called Manhattan, 1609, September 11th, and of course, September 11th, 2001. Back to you now in Atlanta. All right, Gary, thanks for pointing that out. We want to remind all of our viewers that you can email photos of missing friends or relatives to missing at CNN.com or just go to CNN.com and click on the link. The pictures will be posted on our website along with emergency contact phone numbers, so please make sure that you do send along a contact number with that picture. With 189 people presumed dead in the attack on the Pentagon, military experts still involved in an all-out effort to find and identify the remains of each victim. Jeff Levine now has more on their meticulous and possibly dangerous task. A final farewell from the Army's old guard unit and a burial in Arlington National Cemetery is an honor that always comes from making the ultimate sacrifice for your country. Now it's the job of military experts to dig through the ashes of the Pentagon, doing the grim but essential detective work that they hope will put a name on every tombstone of the victims of Tuesday's blast. As of Thursday, Pentagon officials say 126 people are still unaccounted for. When there's been a massive uh, explosion and accident like this, uh, you know, we're not finding uh, intact people. 
The search for more Pentagon attack survivors continues, but now the focus is on identifying the victims, a task that is both scientifically challenging and emotionally draining. Captain Scott Graham, a local rescue official assisting federal authorities, says even intense training doesn't blunt the impact. We had an aircraft crash, we had a building collapse, we had a structure fire, we had a mass casualty event, and we had a hazardous materials uh, incident all in one location. The victims are being transferred to a military morgue at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. For the military, the 70 pathologists there can make a positive ID with as little as an inch of remaining tissue. That can be compared to some 3.2 million DNA samples in the Pentagon's files. If we have a fairly good idea of who the individuals are in an accident or in an incident, we'll be able to utilize the blood stain card and utilize a small piece of tissue to get a positive DNA match. Meanwhile, the rescue and recovery efforts continue, but not without the considerable risk of exposure to disease from human tissue. You have victims that could be coughing, they could be uh, fluids, could be airborne, that sort of thing. So we're worried about the full spectrum, and that's why universal precautions are critical. For now, those precautions have worked, and experts say those inside the stricken structure are also safe. Jeff Levine for CNN, Washington. Well, the horror of last week has had a huge emotional effect on millions of people. And in times of tragedy, there's an overwhelming desire to be with your family and friends. Sharing tears, fears with the people you love somehow has to make it easier to cope. But as Beth Nissen reports, now travel restrictions have prevented many people from getting together. For most New Yorkers, it doesn't seem much like the start of a weekend. Still in a week when so many people who went to work on Tuesday never came home. It was good to see the work week end. Many headed out of town for hastily arranged family gatherings. Jason Spiewak was taking Amtrak to his parents' home in Pennsylvania. I've just been stirred up all week by the, you know, the goings on. I just want to be close to family and friends. Bree McCallop was going home to Florida. Um, I live by myself, and I, I really just don't want to be here right now. I just don't feel comfortable being here. I don't feel safe. Almost everyone understood the desire to get away from the unrelenting anguish and distress and fear to read about and think about something else, anything else. You'd almost want the new fall season on TV because, you know, it's, it's an escape. Everywhere you look is just inundated with the pictures that you've seen over and over and over, and it's 24-7. And you have to switch to something like Cartoon Network just to escape from it. In Times Square, hundreds of people lined up in the rain to buy half-price tickets to Broadway shows. Patricia McClellan was trying to get tickets to Beauty and the Beast for her two school-aged children. Trying to pick up their spirits and get them together and get them away from viewing everything that they've been looking at for the last week. After four days of almost unbearable real-life drama, many wanted to see a stage story with a clear resolution, a happy ending. Uh, the theater provides for us a little bit of release, a little bit of relief from what's going on. Um, we can't ever forget what's gone on here in New York. It's a great tragedy, but it gives us a little bit of a mental vacation. Those who went to New York City movie theaters seemed in search of the same thing. It is quite ironic that I'm choosing to go to the movies for two hours, considering this is like being in a movie. It's surreal. It's like a, a Hollywood horror film, and yet I'm looking for a film to kind of just take my mind away from it, you know. Legions of others just wanted to stay home. Some rented half a dozen videos. I've never rented a movie before. I just got a membership today because I plan on staying in the house all weekend. I'm not going to do anything because of the incident. Because of that horrible incident, NFL and college football games, a usual weekend release for thousands of sports-mad New Yorkers, were canceled. I wish I had the distraction to the release of the football season, but I understand as uh, playing football as myself, um, the tension of what happened at the World Trade Center, I wouldn't want to play if I was a player. Not everyone wanted distraction. Some wanted a few hours of quiet to try to cope with the stun and the sorrow. A lot of people died and it, made, it broke my heart. It literally broke my heart. And I feel like crying right now. Millions of New Yorkers still need comforting. Many said they plan to attend religious services this weekend, go to temple tonight, mass tomorrow, or church on Sunday. 
the Marble Collegiate Church on Fifth Avenue has added a second service Sunday to accommodate what senior minister Arthur Caliandro expects will be standing room crowds. I think what people are looking for is sanctuary, a place to be where they're, they're safe emotionally and physically, but also that we're spiritually. But feeling safe again seems such a long way off for most New Yorkers. So much loss still uncounted. And for most people, nothing they can do except try their best to make it through tomorrow and the next day and a long succession of days after. Beth Nissen, CNN, New York. Well, in business developments related to the attacks, General Electric says it expects $600 million in claims from the destruction of the World Trade Center. MetLife, America's second largest life insurer, says it expects up to $300 million in claims. Standard & Poor's estimates life insurers will pay out between $2 billion and $4 billion in all. Property and liability insurers could be hit with claims totaling at least $20 billion. Well, Ford Motor Company is sharply cutting its production for the third quarter and warns earnings for that same period are going to be weaker than it originally forecast. The world's second largest automaker said it will stop production at five North American assembly plants next week. Heightened security at U.S. borders and the clampdown on air freight service due to Tuesday's attacks have disrupted automakers. The industry relies on tight schedules for parts deliveries. The loss of the World Trade Center wipes out a huge amount of office space in lower Manhattan. That means companies already coping with human losses have to scramble now for new places to reopen their businesses. Peter Viles reports. I think what we could simply do there is thinking if, it's, if, if we have the space is just put two people in the same room temporarily. Well, I think oh, we're in, a cubicle. Cubicle. Cub in a cubicle. Cubicles in a cubicle, yeah. Here. CEOs do not typically worry about who shares a cubicle, but these are not typical times. This is the old American Express headquarters, structurally sound but damaged. Ken Chenault is moving 5,000 workers, some to this new headquarters in Jersey City, others into two larger leased spaces in the Jersey suburbs. Fortunately, all of our core operations and processing are outside of our New York headquarters building all around the world, so we have had virtually no interruption of service for any of our businesses across American Express. 15.5 million square feet of office space was destroyed, another 12 million damaged, meaning the city's businesses are now looking for 27 million square feet of space. American Express has already located nearly a million square feet for itself. When you include suburban office space, Metropolitan New York has 46 million square feet of vacant space available. The problem is finding enough large spaces to replace what has been lost. It is a game of musical chairs right now where uh, the major companies are out really in a, in a frenzy uh, looking for the larger blocks of space. Uh, and commitments uh, are already being made as we speak. Uh, so the, um, we will be essentially out of large blocks of space uh, by next week. In the weeks ahead, this area will be known as the new and temporary world headquarters of American Express. Today it has a much more important designation. It is a staging area for supplies to be ferried across the Hudson River to those thousands of rescue workers who are still working in lower Manhattan. Peter Vile, CNN, Jersey City, New Jersey. And still working at this hour. Stay tuned to CNN for the latest coverage of America's new war. Jonathan Mann and Zane Vergie will be here next. I'm Colleen McEdwards at CNN Center. And I'm Jim Clancy. We want to leave you now. Take a look at some of those live images from the scene of the tragedy. Like a torch, like a beacon, even as we mourn and grieve. For if we are steadfast, we know that no darkness, no evil can ever extinguish that beacon of hope.